Assalamu alaikum. And uh, good evening. It's, been, it's really nice to be back at uh, UNLV. Uh, I've been here before, and this is another, it's almost a home away from California to come to uh, UNLV and uh, to specifically be in this room as well again. Uh, last time it was a full uh, banquet that we have in here, but inshallah we will come and do other visits in the future. Uh, I'm speaking today from American Muslims for Palestine. I chair AMP, is also one of the co-founders. We're uh, a national organization that organizes for Palestine. Uh, but I also chair uh, Muslim Legal Fund of America. And Amal Afay right now is actually representing uh, the students in Harvard in a civil rights complaint to the Department of Education uh, on the violations that, uh, of their civil rights to organize. And as we know post uh, or uh, during the past few months, uh, universities have literally begun to uh, use their institutional power uh, in essence, to censor, to uh, target, uh, to criminalize, uh, and literally to uh, make it possible uh, or to make it impossible for the students who organize for Palestine in particular, uh, SJB students for justice in Palestine, to be able to organize. Uh, so this is in the context of what is occurring on a national level. Uh, first, I always like to uh, start by giving land recognition. I think this area is the Western Shoshone people and uh, other indigenous population. Uh, we are living in a land uh, that is still has not yet recovered uh, from colonization, settler colonization. Uh, one can say that this is the most successful settler colonial project in human history uh, because of the consequences of uh, what took place. And we still owe uh, a recognition of the uh, colonization and the genocide of indigenous people. And we're also waiting for an apology, right? Uh, the only apology that the United States has offered was for the Japanese internment, rightly so, uh, but the indigenous population. Uh, also a recognition of black communities. Today is still the 29th day of February, uh, the shortest month is given to recognize Black History Month. They didn't want to give them 31 days. It's only February, the shortest month. Uh, but the Black community came into uh, this land as cargo in the holds of ships. And they continue to define the arc of moral ethical challenge uh, to this country. Uh, and we still have a long way to go to undo the effects both of the enslavement, Jim Crow, and also uh, the continued violence directed at our black brothers and sisters. Uh, George Floyd is just about, you know, we think about it just, just very recent, and we still have not yet undone some of that damage. So we, we wanna make specifically this recognition. And as people of color, Palestinians, our ability to speak and organize, we're really standing on the shoulders, both of the indigenous people and also uh, the black, uh, leadership and community uh, without them the civil rights act immigration rights reforms act and the border rights act would not have been possible uh, without that arc of moral ethical leadership so we always have to remember this history and context is very important uh, some that basically have not read a book uh, which is a large number of people even those possibly at universities right uh, Palestine is not a thousand year old, uh, or even those who use the uh, biblical text to define and begin the narration of history, they're missing a long, long historical arc. The largest oldest tree, olive tree in the world is found in Palestine. It's very young tree, it's about 7,000 years old. Some put it at 8,000 years old. That tree is still in existence today, right? Uh, so you often hear people say, well, we're going back to uh, right of return to our home from 2000 years. What, what happened before 2000 years? Or some argue, say, Abraham promised us the land. Well, as far as I know, again, as Muslims, we do believe in the prophet Abraham. But as far as Abraham is concerned, 
he migrated from Mesopotamia, present day Iraq, to the land of the Canaanites, Palestine. So if we want to speak about Abraham in terms of indigenous uh, uh, link and connection, originates from Iraq, we tend to say that the Canaanites gave him a green card to arrive in Palestine at that point. And what is important, people cite religious texts relative to the promise that extended to Abraham as an evidence for the right now to claim territory and land. Now, what we know from the narrative, again, the biblical narrative as a historical text, if we study it, it says that Abraham lived as an alien among the Canaanites, meaning that if he received the promise from God, he didn't go around building settlements and ethnically cleansing the Canaanites at the time. More importantly, it says that he spoke the language of the Canaanites. Right? Again, he did not think or use the biblical promise that is used as a way to say everybody needs to be forced to stop speaking the Canaanite language and we need to change it. Third, when Abraham needed to bury uh, his um, family members, he actually bought a land. Right? In the land that is in the city of Al Khalil, where the Abraham, Abrahamic mosque or the Masjid al Ibrahimi is actually there, and he bought the property. Well, I know logic is in short supply these days, especially if you watch the news. If a person had been promised by God a territory, why would he go and purchase the property? Right? So, all this just in terms of history. Uh, Palestine is one of the oldest areas in the world. Uh, the oldest city in the world is in uh, Palestine, is the city of Jericho. Uh, Damascus in Syria is the oldest continuously inhabited city. It's been inhabited from at least uh, uh, dating as about six to seven thousand, sometimes actually even longer. Uh, so it's very important for us when we talk about Palestine history today that we don't begin by 1000 BC, which what the Zionists insist in narrating history because you are removing close to 30,000 years of history from the Stone Age man, Neanderthal, all the way up to the early recorded history in Palestine and so on. So that's very, very, very important because if you don't assert the epistemological notions and the basis of what you are talking about, then you end up what you call arguing on the basis of somebody else's narrative, a colonial narrative. Every colonial project use God as a rationale for the colonial project. Right? Every colonial project use God, right? we call it manifest destiny in here, right? that in essence, we have uh, used Christianity, and I distinguish between imperial Christianity and uh, what you call grassroots folks Christianity. And, and the uh, interesting part about using God is that you can call him on iPhone. Like, God, did you authorize the colonization of my land? Well, no, it's Winston Churchill who did. God, you ask Columbus to go and colonize the indigenous people. No, it's he, he did. So we rationalize our colonial projects historically and in contemporary by religious uh, discourse. Now, today, the arguments people say, well, Palestine and what is taking place with the Palestinians is not colonization. If you say it's colonization, you're anti-Semitic. Right? Not a, you don't even have to take my word. This is literally yesterday, uh, Noah Feldman from Harvard Law School put out a Time Magazine article basically saying, if you say that it is colonization, you're actually, uh, in essence, expressing an anti-Semitic statement. If you say from the river to the sea, you're anti-Semitic. If you say Palestine, you're actually erasing Israel, you're anti-Semitic. Now, don't take my word, take it from the horse's mouth. Herzl, the founder of modern Zionism, in his own writing, he wrote 
a, a letter to Cecil Rhodes. Now, Cecil Rhodes is not what you call your average person. Cecil Rhodes is the minister of colonies, all right? Uh, uh, Cecil Rhodes was such an influential person, he named the whole country on his behalf. Called, he called the country Rhodesia. If you look at the dictionaries in the 1960s, you'll have Rhodesia. Where are you going for vacation? I'm going to Rhodesia. Alhamdulillah, it's no longer Rhodesia because people liberated it, and now it's called Zimbabwe. So he was communicating with the minister of colony of Great Britain to ask for a colonial possession. So he said, you are being invited to help make history. It doesn't involve Africa, but a piece of Asia Minor, not Englishmen, but Jews. How then uh, do I happen to turn to you since this is, this is an out of the way matter for you? How indeed? because it is something colonial. That's Herzl, not me. Actually, I took this last part in my book, it's called Palestine, it is something colonial. That's from the horse's mouth, not me, not anyone else. It's Herzl saying this. So Noah Feldman again, he says, I tried to write a nuance way about the new anti-Semitism. Basically the new anti-Semitism is all of the people that are speaking and rallying for free Palestine are being labeled as anti-Semitic. While if you think about the United States and Europe, there's a heavy spike of real anti-Semitism of the white supremacists, right? white militias. The neo-Nazis are running rampant in Europe, but look at it, uh, Gerd Wilder, who's the current Prime Minister of the Netherlands, he actually was welcomed back and forth to Israel. Gerd Wilder party is a neo-Nazi party. His party members walked into the Dutch parliament wearing Nazi memorabilia. You would think that Noah Feldman, right, would actually spend time on identifying the real anti-Semitism that has taken place, but no, he says that he was nuanced. So I responded to him on uh, X or Twitter. It says Netanyahu's genocidal war in Gaza is not nuanced and good job in providing cover for the extreme right-wing government in Israel. Because everybody is seeing and witnessing what is taking place, Netanyahu is really causing uh, people's reaction and responses to oppose Israel's genocidal policies. It's a genocide that is taking place. And you can't cover it by actually calling people anti-Semitic because they are looking at a genocide. Today, Israel used drones to bomb people that were waiting for food. Literally, if you see the video that came out, 107 bodies just all slaughtered and lining up all civilians. There was no Hamas in there, not a single person with a weapon, nothing. This is drone warfare that also used AI, artificial intelligence. Now, artificial intelligence, we just still can get real intelligence going, and now we're using artificial intelligence. Okay? Artificial intelligence comes out from the deficiencies of the intelligence that we use, and we know we are deficient in the real intelligence. Okay? That's the reality, and you could go and do a test on this. So, uh, Mersheimer from uh, Harvard, Right? He says, I believe Israel was guilty of a serious war crimes, but not genocide during the first two months of the war. Even though there was growing evidence of what Hartov has called genocidal intent on the part of the Israeli leaders. But it became clear to me after the 24th to 30th November 2023 truce ended and Israel went back on the offensive that Israeli leaders were in fact seeding, seeking to physically destroy a substantial portion of Gaza's Palestinian population. All right, so again, Mersheimer is a major political scientist and his, you could actually access his material on YouTube in uh, relations was taking place. And just look at the image of, the, of a child, right? Now, I don't know, there's a level of sickness that we are witnessing, and I don't want to absolve the United States because the same type of sickness we saw it in Iraq with the United States in Abu Ghraib. There's this, what you call, 
uh, Orientalist fantasy, right? That think that uh, stripping Arab men in particular and display them because there is this whole book called The Arab Mind, right? Uh, by Rafael, Rafael Patai that somewhat try to posit that the Arabs are somewhat because of the, their, uh, 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 you know, this is stereotypical construction about their sexuality, and therefore they go almost overboard to try to uh, uh, engage in such violations of basic dignity of human being. Any human being that is stripped naked by anybody will feel violated, and yet this is actually seen as a way to try to illustrate uh, some notion of domination control that has long, long Orientalist back, uh, background to it. Again, uh, similar images in there. Again, what we found out that these images, Israel says these are Hamas. They are not. Actually, these were some doctors, uh, pharmacists, teachers, and so on that were there because people identified them as such. And therefore, the, the notion that these are Hamas is basically a figment of Israeli imagination. Back to context. Balfour Declaration is the, is the document that begins the dispossession of the Palestinian. It's only 68 words of colonial dispossession. For people who think words don't matter, 68 words that still matter till today. His Majesty's government view with favor the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people and will use their best endeavors to facilitate the achievement of this object, it being clearly understood that nothing shall be done which may prejudice the civil and religious rights of existing non-Jewish uh, communities in Palestine or the rights and political status enjoyed by Jews in any other country. If there is a colonial text to read, you could literally write a whole thesis, if not many more thesis on this. One, the British issued this document on November 2nd, 1917. The British did not arrive into Palestine until December 10th or 11th, 1917. So the British promised that which they did not have a right to. They had no control. So that's just a, a, a basic step. Second, 97% of the non-Jewish population, right, which means Palestinians, Muslims, and Christians, as well as Palestinian Jews, their only defining character is non-Jewish. While the 3% that part of it is Zionist is actually given the recognition. So the 97, their only character is their non-Jewish. And the Zionists, who are the smaller portion, are given recognition. Third, we see in here it's speaking about civil and religious rights for the 97% of the population. While the Jewish Zionist population are given national rights, not only on Palestine, but also speaking about their political rights outside. You can't have civil and religious rights if you don't have political rights. If you don't have political rights because civil and religious rights accrue from the fundamental first principle in a modern nation state, which you have to have political rights. So there is no political rights given to the Palestinians, right? And as such, immediately become denationalized as a community, right? From the Balfour Declaration. So this is again becomes the colonial language. Now this should not be seen as an exception to. Uh, the world. If you lived in the world and looked at it around 1914, 85% of the known world service was a colony. Europe's colonization informed Zionism. That's why if you actually notice some of these uh, Zionist spokespeople that speak, they say, we need to win the war on Gaza in order to preserve and defend Western civilization. MashaAllah. Right? Belfort himself, Lord Belfort, was an anti-Semite and was deeply moved by anti-Semitism to transfer and remove the Jews from Europe. Because Europe had two questions that they were, they never have answers, right? They always have questions. 
One is the Jewish question, anti-Semitism, and the second, the Eastern question, Islamophobia. That's why they used to say about the Ottoman, the sick man of Europe, and then they met as Sykes people, the French and the British, to divvy up the territories of the Ottomans. So in general, when somebody today, again, you have to go through a multi lobotomy of history in order for you to stand in there and say that we're defending Western civilization. When Gandhi was told that there Western civilization, he said it's a good idea because they have not yet actually uh, materialized it. So the world was 1914 is a colony and indigenous population had no standing. Part of what we found these today is we speak about a human rights discourse. I'm sorry to tell us again, we Palestinians, we read all the human rights, the Fort Geneva Convention, the UN chart, like we're so, we know every secretary of the UN as it's like he's our cousin, we invite him to our Arab weddings, right? Human rights were not written for us. They were not written to the global South. Again, when, 19, when they adopted the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, much of Africa was a colony. And it's not all of a sudden they signed the deal because they signed the UN Charter in San Francisco, mashallah, right? And they signed the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Did the French, the British, the Dutch, the Belgium, did they all say, okay, you guys are free? Did they do that? No, they had to actually face the struggle. Algeria lost a million and a half people in the last three years. In the 132 years of French colonization of Algeria, 8 million Algerians lost their life. So we pretend or we think that the universal declaration of human rights applies to the darker complexion people, that it applies to Africa, or it applied to Vietnam. Vietnam was a French colonial territory. The United States came to aid the French in Vietnam, and not only had millions of people that were killed in that war from the French and the US, but also bombed Cambodia, uh, also had completely destabilized Laos, and we're still seeing some of those con consequences today. So color, European colonization informs Zionism. Another element, it says, a land without a people for a people without a land. Theodore Herzl was the founder of modern Zionism. He advocated mass Jewish immigration to Palestine. Herzl initially did not consider the indigenous people when he uh, realized they existed, he advocated transferring the Palestinians. This is from Herzl, again, his diaries. If you want the uh, citation, I could give it to you, it's in my book. In his diary, he said, we shall try to spirit the penniless population across the border by procuring employment for it in transit countries, while denying it employment in our country. The property owners, like the Palestinian Authority, will come over to our side. Both the process of expropriation and the removal of the poor must be carried out discreetly and circumspectly. Transfer is not incidental to Zionism, it's foundational. They actually sent a delegation to survey Palestine. And when they came, they said, the bride is beautiful, but it's already spoken for. That's how they described Palestine, right? That again, that it's already, there wasn't an inch on an area except that it was heavily populated and cultivated. Another uh, added piece to this, uh, the notion that uh, Zionists uh, say that we made the desert bloom. And I don't know if you have uh, seen, Palestine is one of the most heavily recorded areas in human history, next to Egypt. Right? If you read the Bible, it's all about Palestine, like all these Palestinians in soccer in the Bible, right? <laughs> if you read the Torah, it's also Palestine, Mesopotamia, Egypt. Uh, if you read early Islamic history, it's Palestine. If you read the Romans were there, right? the Greeks were there, the Persians were there. Now, what we know for a fact from the earliest recorded history until 1948, this was never a desert. There was a desert down south in the Naqab, but that is down south. So much so that this area was called the land of milk and honey. I did not get honey in my tea, so just <laughs> the land of milk and honey. So how does a, man, a land of milk and honey that exists from the earliest time until 1948, then the New York Times say they the desert bloom. So again, if it's in the New York Times, it must be true. You need to 
create the propaganda to legitimize the dispossession of the indigenous population. We did it in this country. They don't know how to deal with, the, with their land. All right? They have no relationship to private property. Well, whether, you have, whether I have a private property or not, it's none of your business. But even I'll go with the ridiculous. Even if it's a desert, it does not give you the right to colonize it. How is about that? Whether you made the desert bloom or not, if you pillage and are a settler colonial power, that does not give you the right, even if you created all the mass vegetation that is there. Balfour Declaration was incorporated into Israel uh, Declaration of Independence. All right. This right, this right was recognized in the Balfour Declaration. So not all. Now, before this, the declaration was incorporated to the League of Nations. It was also incorporated in Resolution 181 in advocating for the two-state uh, resolution. So it's all along been stretched. So Balfour Declaration is the first public document that began the process of dispossession of the Palestinians. Now, a letter to Lord Corazon, he says in, in the red, and Zionism, be it right or wrong, good or bad, is rooted in age-long tradition, in present needs, in future hopes, of far profounder import than the desires and prejudices of the 700,000 Arabs who now inhabit that ancient land. Okay? You can't actually, these days you have what you call Johnny come late of, of discourse, or oh, there's no such thing, that there was no Palestinians in there. They all came from the Arabs when Zionism started their settlements and improved the economy. It's actually, it's a complete false. Because the Zionists, they set up settlements, the, Israel, the, uh, uh, the Zionist history, which is the uh, unions, prohibit the employment of Arab labor. So on the one hand, you say that these Arabs came to work in our industries and agriculture. On the other, your own actually labor unions prohibit the employment of Arab laborers. Again, logic is of short supply these days. So Balfour Declaration is colonial legalism. The Balfour Declaration is a type of colonial legalism seeking dishonesty in each word with the sole purpose of providing a cover for the outright slight thievery of Palestine from its indigenous population. Again, this assertion is there from the early period. Now, whenever we speak about Palestine, we only think about the Muslim population in Palestine. But I want you to see how the Christian population, the Eastern Orthodox, are treated because literally, likewise, are constantly under uh, 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 assault. Uh, uh, this is an Eastern Orthodox Sunday in Jerusalem. And this is the treatment or that they face by Israeli military, prohibiting them from accessing uh, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. There are some Palestinians who grew up in Beit Lahem, uh, in Naz, uh, not in Naz, in Beit Lahem, in the West Bank. They have not been able to actually arrive and go and in Easter Sunday or uh, participate in religious activities. Uh, now, Americans who come with American passport because you're a privileged class, you come into what you call the Disneyland VIP tour of uh, Palestine. So you go in and come out, oh, I had a great time in attending Easter services and uh, Christmas mass in uh, uh, the Holy Land. There's also Israeli settlers spit on nuns in Jerusalem. It's a practice that, again, Ben Gavir just uh, supported this practice. So as they walk around, they spit on a Christian community. It's just unbelievable that this actually, if it happened, can you imagine, all right, for a moment, if a Muslim does this to any Christians in any, I would say CNN, Fox, and so on, will be on 24 seven. And this again is a practice that takes place. And the unfortunate thing is the evangelical Christian right in here is lock, stock, and barrel uh, supporting Israel for their own purposes. And we'll get to that at the end of it. Now, one of the most important question is why did Great Britain uh, created or promise Palestine uh, to create a, uh, a Zionist state? And I say that uh, they wanted to strike two camels with one stone, not two birds, two camels. I said Europe had a anti-Semitic problem, 
and there have been constant discussions about how to deal with the Jewish. And again, this uh, European history is just a full history of anti-Semitism, of violence against uh, Jews, violence against minorities. And you could go back to 1492 and take it all the way up to the present as part of a historical, uh, what you call, uh, continuity. Uh, the Crusades, when the Crusades passed, every place where they met Jews, they slaughtered and had pogroms against Jews. Right? So Europe had an anti-Semitic problem, and England had anti-Semitic problem that Belfort was part of it. So on the one hand, you take externalized Jewish population. But the second part is that there's something called the Suez Canal. And the British, uh, which wanted to secure their uh, resources that they were pillaging out of India. The British colonized India. And uh, India is actually the golden goose for the British royal family and the British crown. When the British arrived to India, India was about 24% of the global GDP. When they left India, they reduced India to 3% of the global GDP, meaning that what they robbed from India, what they stole is almost 17 times the current GDP of England. Uh, I have never seen what you call a cartel family, like the British royal family, display all what they stole in every wedding and funeral. Oh my God, oh that bling bling, oh that's from Kenya. Oh that crown, oh that came from India. Oh that, literally if you talk about the whole family, jewels, gold and so on, if you go to the British Museum, it's just literally one area after other of a stolen material. They drag massive amount. And if you have, have anybody here visited Louvre? All right. If you visited Louvre, have you seen the Egyptian collection, the Persian collection, the Chinese collection? My God, how did they manage to rob all this stuff? All right. You're talking about a wall 24 by 24 dragged out. All right. I, I call the Louvre and the uh, British Museum and, you know, you have Alibaba and the 40 thieves. It's the den for the 40 thieves and Alibaba is in Guantanamo Bay. That's literally uh, what you have. So the British were, if you're going to drag all the materials from India and all of the material from East Africa, because the British had control of East Africa from South Africa all the way up to Egypt, you needed to have secure path and trade. So they colonized India. They colonized Yemen, and they colonized Egypt and Sudan. And then they began to think about a buffer state. A buffer state in order to secure the uh, path, fearing the Ottoman might uh, retake their territory, because Egypt was under, uh, even tangentially under the uh, Ottomans during uh, uh, the reign of uh, 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 Muhammad Ali and his uh, dynasty, and uh, they were also fearing Russian possible interference. So creating a buffer state that will always be beholden to a benefactor, which is the British, uh, thus allowing the British or the West, the West in general to continue to intervene. Today we know that the Suez Canal, 16% of global trade passes through the Suez Canal, till today. And as we know, the Houthis in the South are tugging on that important artery of trade globally and natural gas and oil passes there. Adding to this today, there's a second aspect or third aspect of the modern. There's a massive gas deposit just outside the coast of Gaza that Israel, uh, Egypt, uh, Greece and so on are all talking about and the Europeans want to invest. BP just signed a contract to actually begin to uh, explore this natural gas. Why? Because they want massive natural gas supplies to offset the Russian uh, uh, gas supply. Uh, because Europe needs approximately 40 million cubic metric tons of gas per day. Uh, and that resource right now comes predominantly from uh, Russia through the existing pipeline and then some of the Gulf states. If that uh, oil field off the coast of Gaza is developed, it will be an easy shipping uh, to Europe 
And that's a third as we speak in the contemporary period. Many of us make a mistake by speaking of the Nakba of 1948. The Nakba begins in 1917 with the British arrival uh, and the creation of the mandate. So the mandate policy made it possible to facilitate Zionist immigration and settlement in Palestine, facilitating land transfer to the Zionist agency, oppressing Palestinian uprising and closing eyes or encouraging underground Zionist militia, the Ergen, Haganah and Stern gangs that began to actually develop their own military, economic empowerment of Zionist settlers in Palestine, early withdrawal without a political settlement for the question of Palestine. So the Nakba begins in 1917. And you have also the period of uh, the Great Arab Revolt from 1936 to 39, where it actually pushed Palestinian leadership to be outside of Palestine. All right, so that's also part of the history that we need to understand. Yes, in 48, you have the mass ethnic cleansing, but it was the British that made it possible for this uh, incubating a state within a state and preventing Palestinians from achieving their uh, uh, aspirations of having independence and sovereignty. Again, going back to Jabotinsky, who is now, Jabotinsky, you need to know, Jabotinsky is an important figure. Netanyahu's father was the editor and the keeper of Jabotinsky's papers. There is, and Jabotinsky is the, literally the precursor or the, one of the founding uh, ideologues for the Likud. If you understand Netanyahu, both in terms of his father and his uh, family, there's no way he's going to give any two-state solution to the Palestinians, and he's been insisting on it, right? You could actually respect his uh, consistency. He consistently opposed the creation of a Palestinian state. Vladimir Jabotinsky, who's actually the Iron Wall, wrote, a voluntary reconciliation with the Arabs is out of the question, either now or in the future. If you wish to colonize a land in which people are already living, you must provide a garrison for the land or find some rich man or benefactor was the British. Now it's all of us, the US, we, we are the benefactor uh, who will provide a garrison on your behalf. All of us just send Israel about $14 billion, right? On top of the other allotments. So we are the benefactors or else or else give up your colonization for without an armed force, which will render physically impossible any attempts to destroy or prevent this colonization, colonialism is impossible. Not difficult, uh, not difficult, not dangerous, but impossible. Zionism is a colonization adventure and therefore it stands or falls by the question of armed force. It is important to speak Hebrew, but unfortunately, it is even more important to be able to shoot or else I am through with playing at colonizing. So today when you speak about Palestine is a, facing a settler colonial project, people call you that you're anti-Semite. You just don't know history. Don't take my word. Take Herzl, take Jabotinsky, uh, take Joseph White. Between ourselves it must be clear that there is no room for both peoples together in this country. We shall not achieve our goal if the Arabs are in this, in this small country. There is no other way than to transfer the Arabs from here to neighboring countries. All of them, not one village, not one tribe should be left. All right? Joseph Weitz, again, here, head of the Jewish agency's colonization department. Even their official infrastructure was actually called uh, a Jewish agency's colonization. The ruler rebellion, 1936 to, uh, to 38, culminating in 39. The rebels numbered more than 15,000. Uh, British responded first by 20,000 troops and then used the Royal Air Force for the first time to actually bomb Palestinian civilians. Also need to remind people that the British also were the first to introduce chemical weapons in Gaza Iraq during the period of World War I. So again, these are uh, things that we need to remember and recall. 
because you hang out in different places where people eat croissant and drink espresso, they begin to pontificate about human rights to you. All right? Just since 9-11, four and a half million Muslims have perished as a result of so-called war on terror. Iraq, Afghanistan, Libya, Somalia, uh, Yemen, all right? uh, Syria, all these are post nine. Just say, I'm fighting terrorism, and you just go out to the races. You can bomb people, you could torture people, and it's being rationalized. And then all of a sudden, they try to project on us that we are uncivilized, right? This is the discourse that we have. The partition plan of 1947-48, resolution 181 divided Palestine into two states. Zionist state given 56% of the land, Arab state given 42% of the land, Jerusalem 2% international. At the time of Resolution 181, the Jewish agency and the Zionist settlers in Palestine had only title to 6% of the land. Yet the United Nations, with the pressure of the United States threatening uh, states to vote in favor of Resolution 181, were granted 56%, some of the most uh, important land, uh, and especially in the coastal areas uh, and, and agriculture areas. But more importantly, the Jewish state actually would have been a binational state in 1947-48. In the Zionist state to be, 492,000 Zionist Jews lived and 430,000 Palestinian Arabs. No decisive Jewish majority existed, thus the need to ethnically cleanse the state from its Arab population. So Zionists wanted a decisively Jewish majority state. And that's why they unleashed uh, ethnic cleansing with already research done and mapping of the villages that took place in the village files, which Elon Pape writes about it in his book, The Ethnic Cleansing of Palestine. Benny Morris, who writes about the refugee problem, right, and then speaks and comments, he says, well, you have to break eggs in order to make an omelet. Talk about somebody, right? Uh, justifying ethnic cleansing by comparing it to making an omelet. So the eggs were the Palestinians, the omelet to be made literally is the new Israeli state. So there is no dispute about the facts relative to what happened in 1948 in order to achieve a decisive Jewish majority state. The mapping of the, of the communities occurred with the help of academics in Tel Aviv University, and that's where we speak about academic complicity in the ethnic cleansing of Palestine. Because when you speak about, we need to support PDS in universities, so we are academically, what you call, we have to have academic inquiry and free academic inquiry. Okay, mashallah, how many Palestinian universities have been destroyed in this last four months? 14 universities. Have any president of a university in the United States uttered a word? about academic freedom of the Palestinians. Just a word. How many of the universities actually have relationship with Palestinian universities? How many actually have a visiting faculty from any of these Palestinian universities? How many actually spoke about the complete destruction of Palestinian archives in Gaza? And the destruction of libraries that took place. And then you got jo Johnny Kamleli, who eats a, what you call a $5 subway, comes to talk to you about academic freedom and make you feel that you are the person that is limiting the academic inquiry of people uh, that is taking place. Morality and ethics basically uh, is in a frozen lab when it comes to Palestinians, but I would also add to other people as well. Settler colonialism engages in two things, transfer and genocide. Sometimes they're done in succession Sometimes together, every settler colonial project engages in genocide and transfer. Don't take my words for it. Go out in here. You must have some Native American reservations. Right? The Native Americans were committed to genocide. The remaining population were sent to reservations. I call them refugee camps transferred and we took the best land and then more importantly in the uh, 
various areas where you had the buffalo, we actually paid people to go and shoot the buffalo because that was the source of sustenance, food, and uh, use of uh, the leather and the hides for uh, survival. That's our history. So don't take my word, look at it and think about this uh, genocide and transfer. 532 villages, 11, 12 urban centers, plans, 100 massacres done to cause the flight of the Palestinians. Uh, ben, uh, Menachem Begin, who participated in the Der Yassin massacre, in his book, The Revolt, he says, without the success and without the victory in Der Yassin, there would not have been a, a Jewish state. That's his word in his book, not mine again, in terms of uh, this evidence. Palestinians say that Israel and the Zionists took Palestine fully furnished. You know, when you get an Airbnb and you rent it fully furnished, Palestine was fully furnished, was fully cultivated, all kinds of resources, 12 urban centers completely taken over. It says, we walked outside, Ben Gurion accompanying us, the Lord repeated his question, what is to be done with the population? Ben Gurion waved his hand in a gesture which said, drive them out. Population of Lid did not leave willingly. Was no way avoiding the use of force and warning shots in order to make the inhabitants march 10 to 15 or 15 miles to the point where they met up with the Legion, meaning the uh, Jordan, Transjordan Legion. Okay, so again, the Nakba. Willful denial. Uh, Golda Meir, and you have a movie that is coming out, most likely they're not going to, this, there was no such thing as a Palestinian. They never existed. Right? How can we return the occupied territories? There is nobody to return them to. Again, I'm going to take Golda Meir on her words. If there is no Palestinians, then Israel must be fighting ghosts. And that is possible on the History Channel. Again, this willful denial, right? Again, I can understand, say, we defeated you, we took over, power determined, mashallah, if power is the only ingredient, power is never lasting. The only constant is change. So this willful denial still till today. The transfer and ethnic cleansing continues. We must use terror, assassination, intimidation, land confiscation, and the cutting of all social services to lead to rid the Galilee of its Arab population. This is what the Israel coin, the coin memorandum, because the annexation of the Galilee required ethnic cleansing. So we're not talking about 48, right? Uh, cracking eggs to make omelet, but we're talking about 1976 of actually how to empty the Galilee of its population. Now, in here, this these third t-shirts that are worn by some of the uh, contemporary both settlers, but also some Israeli soldiers, that every, let every Arab mother know that her son's fate is in my hands. This is the shirt uh, worn casually and comfortably by an Israeli student and is at an Israeli university. There is another shirt that has a Palestinian pregnant woman. It says one, sh one shot, right, two lives. Literally, uh, in essence, insinuating uh, almost a genocidal intent. This is the current Israeli government, right? During the election campaign, an Israeli man walks past an electoral billboard bearing portraits of Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, uh, flanked by the far-right politician Itamar ben Gavir, uh, Bezlol Smotrich, and Michael ben Ari, with a caption in Hebrew leading, reading, Kahana lives. Kahana is a reference to the movement that started by Mayor Kahana. The Kahana movement is actually prohibited in the United States as a terrorist organization. But yet, this was, this is the government, this is the uh, partners, right? It's taken place. I don't know if you notice when uh, we mobilized heavily, all of a sudden, uh, Biden got up and uh, uh, said, gave us what you call a little bit of, uh, not even a knafe, a smell of a knafe. He said he's going to impose sanctions on four settlers. MashaAllah, I went to eat for it. Four settlers, right? And I said, if you really want to talk about settlements, why don't we begin by actually unequivocally saying settlements are all against international law and illegal. That any amount of money the Israeli government spends on the settlers will deduct from their foreign aid. We're also going to remove all of the settlements from the SWIFT transaction, like what we did with Russia when we invaded Ukraine. 
more important, we're not going to allow any of the Israeli settlements products like and again we're coming on ramadan there's a lot of uh, israeli dates including in costco we're not going to allow any of the israeli products to come to the u.s market uh, and israeli products that have mfn most favorable nation clause right how about actually ben gavir who's actually is a kahana saying that we'll designate you as supporting terrorism but he felt that he could what you call give a small smell or a picture for uh, for people in this uh, seeing that people are opposing and they might actually vote for him. I, uh, I don't know what he was thinking, but that's basically what took place. Benjamin Netanyahu, uh, the Jewish people have an exclusive and unquestionable right to all areas of the land of Israel. This is the policy statement uh, uh, that were actually, as uh, government took office, and he says all of the area C, which is about 60% plus of the West Bank, now will be incorporated. So when this is a policy in essence saying that there is no two state solution. Uh, there is complete uh, negation of this possibility. So this is the effective policy. Then followed up the coalition agreement also state that the nation of Israel has a natural right uh, uh, to the land of Israel with such a sweeping statement that eliminates Israel colonial history. The document also pledges in the light of the belief in that aforementioned right the prime minister will formulate and promote policies within whose framework sovereignty will be applied to Judea and Samaria, meaning the West Bank. So that's the effective policy. So when people say oh, it's all started October 7th, the policy of settler colonialism begins much, much earlier. And even before October 7th, Palestinians were facing some of the most bloodiest attacks. Almost on a daily basis, two or three Palestinians were being shot or killed. The Israeli leader statement, we are uh, dropping hundreds of tons of bombs on Gaza. The focus is on destruction, not accuracy. Right? Uh, there will be no electricity, no food, no fuel. Everything is closed. We are fighting animal people. Right? This is again, uh, Galant. Uh, and no US press person interviewed him and asked him whether you mean animal or what do you mean by that? But you remember, you know, Pierce Morgan, who all of a sudden uh, wanted to be sophisticated. Every person he said, I want you to condemn, right? How many Israeli spokesperson, anyone asked him to condemn any type of attack or any of these statements? Zero. Zilch. Right? And uh, this is the question that is asked is a silencing question. They really don't want you to have a discourse. They want to run the conversation. We will turn Gaza into an island of ruins. Uh, now there is only one goal, Nakba. Right? Now look at it. It's illegal to teach about the Nakba in Israel, and Israel does not recognize the Nakba, but they are threatening Palestinians in Gaza with the Nakba. Right? I have never seen such a chutzpah, but again, uh, we're, we're seeing this as it falls in front of us. Mapping Israel occupation, about approximately 6.8 million uh, Jewish Israelis, and there's 6.8 million Palestinians in historical Palestine. So it's a 50% 50, 50 population. So that also gets us to then. Israel does not want to have a binational state or a state that would not have a Zionist decisive majority. So the engagement in the forceful expulsion that is being contemplated. Illegal settlements, because we need to understand when Palestinians signed the Oslo, uh, what was it, 1993, there was only about 130,000 settlers uh, in, in the West Bank. Uh, today, with peace, we're close to 750,000 settlers, which means that number of settlers have uh, increased by close six folds. Uh, since the signing of Oslo. Let me also remind people, because again, history is uh, a little bit tough. It was the Israeli right wing that actually disrupted the peace process. Just uh, in 1994, if you remember, just a couple of days ago, Baruch Goldstein, the uh, American doctor, settler doctor, walked into the Ibrahimi mosque in Khalil, Hebron, 
shot 29 Palestinians and injured many others uh, in the hope of disrupting the peace process. And then followed by, in the Israeli election, thereafter you have Yigal Amir, who assassinated Rabin. And at the time, the agitation against Rabin was carried out by Netanyahu. Uh, they put posters of Rabin dressed in the Palestinian Kufi, the one that today people are harassing you and saying it's a symbol of terrorism. They put that on the head of Rabin and put all the posters around uh, Israel to say he's a traitor. And that's how created the context that led to his assassination. And Netanyahu literally did not want a two-state solution. And the ending of us was one of those uh, policies. So literally, as the discussion about two-state solution, uh, while people were discussing ordering a pizza, the Israeli government with its settlers were devouring all the pizza that is being produced. Nothing is left in, in relation to this. U.S. policy empowers and emboldens Israel, and that's where we are today. Uh, the U.S. cast veto in the United Nations Security Council. And I says have cast three veto powers just in the past uh, uh, four months to protect Israel. Extending military and economic support. All the bombs that are being thrown in Gaza right now are coming from either directly from the United States or the pre-positioned uh, ammunition that is present in the region in the in the u.s uh pre-positioned uh, uh materials shield israel in all international settings it was just uh bewildering to see the united states representative at the international uh, court of justice calling on the icj not to actually uh, uh not to issue a ruling finding israel being uh engaged in a genocide and not only that, the German government as well uh, come in, but thank God for Namibia, it reminded Germany about its uh, uh, genocidal policies because before Germany had the Holocaust and genocide in Europe, they actually implemented the genocide in Namibia. Right? So again, uh, the United States is shielding uh, Israel uh, across, links USA to normalization with Israel, all of the people or the countries in the region that received U.S. aid, part of a percentage of the aid that is given to Jordan, to Egypt, to any of the countries is to be linked to normalizing with Israel as a precondition. So the United States, in essence, facilitate this on a regular basis. Incentives on corporate and military cooperation with Israel. So many of the military contracts and corporations that have these relations it actually, the United States makes it possible, punishes opposition to Israel domestically, uh, as well as punishes uh, 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 anyone that uh, critiques Israel. We have laws in our country right, that prohibits engaging in the PDS, boycott, divestment, and sanction. Uh, I had a case in, in the state of Arizona. I was came to give a talk at Arizona State University. And the university wanted me to sign a contract to pro to actually uh, 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 to say that I will not speak about PDS or on PDS while in the university for my contract. My lecture was on PDS. So I actually took the university to court and we won uh, the court uh, case against the state of Arizona. Interesting part is Arizona was boyco boycotting California but yet Arizona was saying you cannot boycott Israel. So you could boycott California, a state within the United States, but you can't boycott Israel. Same thing with Florida and so on. This is again part of the discourse. 34 states have passed uh, such legislation and then criminalizes and target Palestinian activism. I don't know if you have, uh, SJP uh, has been uh, harassed, targeted, uh, in state of Arizona, all of the chapters of the SJP have been uh, closed. There's a case now by the ACLU. Uh, Columbia University uh, suspended both uh, SJP and Jewish Voice for Peace. Uh, Harvard uh, had harassed and continued to harass students uh, and so on. Uh, and the demand is again to censor and uh, call the SJP as a front for Hamas. This is literally what is taking place. What we know for a fact 
is that the Israeli Prime Minister office communicated with Stephen Emerson, asking Stephen Emerson if he have any evidence that SJP receives any support from Hamas. So they know for a fact there is nothing in there, but in essence, the propaganda literally is to put false information, exaggerate information, because I know they cannot defend the position of Israel today. You cannot defend Israel's genocide. You cannot defend settlements. You cannot defend Netanyahu's position. So the only thing that is left is demonize the opposition and trying to uh, throw literally all kinds of dirt on them in order for them to be pushed out from civil society because the effect of what people are doing is already impactful. And what we need is to continue to double, triple, and quadruple our effort. So today we're witnessing literally a whole global community both in the global south and in the global north. And the fact that South Africa brought the case of genocide against Israel is very, very, very important. South Africa has lived their relationship with Zionism and Israel. The first government to visit Israel after its creation was the South Africa apartheid government in 1948. And then Israel and South Africa struck a relationship for the long period of time. During the uh, weapons embargo, Israel was one of the countries that violated the United Nations weapons embargo on South Africa. And they funneled weapons to South Africa in order to uh, continue to arrest the apartheid regime. And also trying to uh, work here in the United States to protect and promote uh, South Africa. The South African government just recently also uncovered documents that the Israeli government was ready to sell and to transport to Israel, to uh, Israel to transport to South Africa nuclear materials in order to facilitate the South African nuclear project. Israel also helped South Africa uh, in building the fence between Mozambique and South Africa because the ANC was struggling against the apartheid regime from South Af from Mozambique and the Israeli companies helped build the fence. Domestically in the United States, the ADL spied on South African activists in the United States and shared that information with the South Africa anti-apartheid uh, regime. I know that because I have all the files because Arlo Smith in San Francisco and in LA raided the ADL offices in 1992, and it turned out that they were sharing that information about the South Africa apart anti-apartheid activists, as well as Irish activists, the United States, who were uh, pushing for the freedom of the Irish. These are facts. So South Africa understand that Palestinians were with them from the get-go. Palestinians engaged in supporting politically, in supporting militarily in terms of training the South African activists in Algeria, in Mozambique, in Lebanon. So when Nelson Mandela, after he literally after he was released from jail, two weeks after met with Yasser Arafat, he said, we're comrades. And then he visited Palestine and said that our freedom is incomplete without the freedom of the Palestinians. When he went to Gaza, he visited Gaza, he said, I feel at home in Gaza. This is Nelson Mandela. Today, people walking around as Nelson Mandela was next to Netanyahu. People who were supporters of apartheid, just South Africa today are trying to pull the rugs over our eyes Right, to tell us that that's not the case. No, I'm sorry, this is history, this is fact, this is what happened and this is what's done. And South Africa literally today is representing the global South with its allies in the global North and we're challenging the hypocrisy, the double standard, the continued depravity of the Western world. Hypocrisy is so large that you don't even have to argue it anymore. Even the International Criminal, International Court of Justice while we're happy with the, not happy, but somewhat uh, uh, delighted that they said plausibility of genocide, they didn't issue an immediate ceasefire. Ukraine and South, and when Russia invaded the Ukraine, it was immediate. They issued a ruling. They didn't have to fight between the line. They didn't have to go and sneak and, and get all of the language in, in there. Again, in four months, more children have been killed in Gaza than any other war uh, through the 20th century in terms of percentage, in terms of numbers. So again, we are in gratitude to South Africa for what it's done, 
But this is actually a moment for us to continue to do our work, double our effort. Don't allow anybody to silence you. Don't allow anybody to actually not uh, to tell you that you are on the wrong. We're on the right side of history. The, as they say, the arc of justice is very, the arc of history is very long, but it tips toward justice and justice will come and we will see free Palestine. Just be very sure that we will see free Palestine. It is closer than we think. Continue to do the work, continue to organize, continue to make a difference because we are making a difference despite the uh, calamities and the difficulties that we're seeing. So thank you for listening and hopefully... Uh, Sorry for keeping away from the food.